Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 457th episode, we're starting our little mini season that we're calling Beyond Bones, Dinosaur Soft Tissue. Yes, it is all about dinosaur soft tissue. And the next three episodes, we'll be talking about different aspects of soft tissue. And this episode is all Sabrina. Yes, it is. But I'm sure I'm still going to talk a bunch because I can't help it. (laughs) You might even talk more than me because that's happened before. It has happened before. I shouldn't, though. It should be mostly you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we'll find out. So, yeah, we're talking all about different dinosaur soft tissues in this episode. As this first episode in our mini season, Beyond Bones, we're going to give more of an overview of what soft tissues are and the types that have been found with dinosaurs, which is more than you might expect. Yeah, there are a lot of things that fossilize that aren't just bones, thus the little series title. And then we have Dinosaur of the Day, Chilesaurus or Chilisaurus. Or Chilesaurus. (laughs) Sure. And of course, a fun fact. And the Chilesaurus, it's revisited because we did talk about it when it first was named. It was a news item, but enough new stuff has come out that it was worth revisiting. But before we get into all of that, as always, we like to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have a new patron to thank, and that's Pamela. Thank you very much for joining. And then rounding out our shout outs, we've got Lorasaurus. T-Bear, Dr. Vespa, Richard, Tyrant King, Micah Marcos Music, The Howard Family, Reed, and Paul B. Yay, thank you, Dino-It-Alls. We are so happy that you're part of our community and your support means a lot to us. Jumping into the (laughs) (laughs) miniseries, we actually do have some news items that'll come up later in this mini-season. But since this is an overview episode, it is a little more evergreen, I would say. In other words, no news. (laughs) Yeah. So like we said, we're starting with dinosaur soft tissues. And a lot, if not most, of what we know about dinosaurs is based on their bones. For most of paleontology, where scientists were studying dinosaurs specifically, scientists didn't think it was possible for anything but the bones to fossilize. Definitely the most common. Mm. But in recent years, paleontologists have been finding new ways to study old bones, and they found that in some cases, and more often than we think, soft tissues had been preserved. And that's a big deal because it can tell us a lot more about these animals. But first, what is soft tissue? Well, soft tissues are in most parts of the body. They can include fat, muscle, nerves, blood vessels, ligaments, which connects bones or cartilages or holds together a joint, tendons, and other fibrous tissues, as well as organs like the brain, the heart, etc. Everything that isn't a bone, pretty much. Yep. That's why they can tell us a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Now, it is rare for soft tissues to fossilize. Soft tissues decay quickly, but they can be preserved in the right conditions. They have to be buried quickly and without oxygen, or at least very little oxygen, and they need to be fossilized in rocks with bacteria-inhibiting minerals. Although by quickly, it's not necessarily as quickly as we used to think. We had that recent news article where they're talking about desiccation and deflation, where they thought maybe it could be out for a couple months before it got buried, but we're not talking about years and years, Mm -hmm. like maybe could be the case with a bone. Yeah, good point. And that study with the desiccation and deflation of a hadrosaur, that's just part of the exciting new work that's being done that shows us, like, hey, there is more soft tissue out there than we realize. In 2018, Ross Anderson and others found that fossils like those found in Burgess Shale in the Canadian Rocky Mountains, these are fossils from the Cambrian over 500 million years old, they were more likely to have soft tissue because they were buried around specific minerals. This team studied over 200 Cambrian fossils that were found on four continents and from 19 different sedimentary layers, and they looked at the chemical compositions of the sediments surrounding the soft tissue and mineralized skeletons. Now, as a quick recap, Fossils are the remains or the traces of the remains of animals and plants, and there's a few ways to become a fossil. 
One common way, though, is through mineralization, when minerals slowly replace the bones. With the Burgess shale fossils, they found the soft tissue fossils were not chemically altered, and they were compressed and sealed within certain clay materials, so these were non-mineralized. And the composition of the sediments that surround the animal matter when it comes to preserving soft tissues. This team found that having more than 20% berthiarine gave a greater than 90% chance of preserving soft tissue because that mineral has antibacterial properties. This makes it more difficult or prevents enzymes from breaking down the soft tissue, so it slows down the process of decay. However, having berthiarine on a dig site doesn't guarantee that there will be soft tissues preserved there. There's other factors like climate, chemistry of the water, runoff, and fauna. Like if an animal gets scavenged, then obviously those soft tissues won't still be around. Yeah. I also remember there was something about how some bacteria might actually help with (laughs) preserving soft tissue because they might affect the amount of minerals or like the exact pH or something of the skin as it's being buried I shouldn't say just skin, Mm -hmm. any soft tissue as it's getting buried. So it's quite an interconnected mix of factors in terms of the minerals, the bacteria, the temperature, all the different things that can affect decay rates. Yes. But if we know that there could be specific minerals to look for, that can help a lot in terms of going back to a site and finding more soft tissue. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And it's good to know in advance so you don't accidentally destroy it Mm -hmm. because you're just expecting a bone. So you just dig until you hit bone. If you know maybe there's some soft tissue, you might stop a little early or be a little bit more careful on the way down. Mm -hmm. So going back to what we can learn from soft tissue, we can learn a lot about an animal's ecology and how they interacted with animals in their environment and their biology. There's a lot of types of fossilized soft tissues. As an example, and we'll go through a bunch of examples here, but soft tissue in the feet and claws of dinosaurs have been found. And we talked about that in episode 432, about how Microraptor and how its feet were like a hawk. Yeah. So knowing that soft tissue gave us a little better of an idea of how it lived. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, what kind of foot padding they have can tell you maybe what kind of stuff they were walking on. It can also show you the position of the bones within the foot. Because like if you've ever seen that elephant foot with the huge fleshy pads underneath it, if you just have the skeleton, you'd have no idea that they had this massive chunk of fat for supporting their foot. Mm -hmm. We kind of assume that animals like sauropods did because it seems like it would be helpful for walking. But you don't really know for sure until you actually find it. Yeah. And then, like we were saying, there's some dinosaurs, especially hadrosaurs, that have been found still covered in skin, and we often call these dinosaur mummies. One of the most famous dinosaur mummies is Leonardo, a Brachylophosaurus. Leonardo was about 22 feet or 7 meters long and weighed between 1.5 and and 2 tons, and about 90% of Leonardo is covered in skin, which is pretty amazing to think about. Yeah, that is a lot of skin. Then there's Dakota, the desiccation and deflation hadrosaur you mentioned, Garrett. Mm-hmm. The nearly complete Edmontosaurus, only the head, tip of the tail, and left arm are missing. And about half of Dakota is covered in skin. And because it has a lot of iron in it, the skin looks a little shiny. Yeah, as in uh, kind of glittery, mm-hmm. shimmering. <laughs> What's that saying? All that glitters is gold. All that glitters is soft tissue in dinosaurs. <laughs> I think the expression is all that glitters isn't gold. Oh, well, then that's right. Yeah, because it could be soft tissue. (laughs) Could be dinosaur skin. (laughs) You could see tooth and claw marks on the skin, and that means that there was time after Dakota died for animals to scavenge and eat it. And like you were saying, Garrett, Dakota helps us show that mummified dinosaurs didn't have to be buried quickly after death in order to mummify. So with the desiccation and deflation, what may have happened, what probably happened, was that a carnivorous animal punctured Dakota's skin to get to the tasty insides, but then left behind that tough skin and the less meaty parts. And then the holes in the skin allowed the animal to dry out without completely decomposing. Then the skin deflated and collapsed onto the bones before the dinosaur was buried. 
Yeah, I think I remember them saying too, it wouldn't necessarily have to be like a large predator biting into it. You could get the same effect with like a beetle or some other animal cutting through the skin as long as it's sort of near the bottom and punching holes <laughs> like mm -hmm. a colander so that it, the liquid can ooze out while it's keeping some of the more solid bits together, then it all works. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that we mostly know about hadrosaur mummies. I mean, there's there are other dinosaur mummies out there, but hadrosaurs seem to be the most common ones. Yeah, the, some combination of maybe the type of skin that they had, maybe their skin was thicker, or maybe their skin had certain types of minerals in it, or on it, or near it, <laughs> that added to the effect, or who knows what was going on with them. But Well, we have an idea now. Because in 2019, Matteo, Fabri, and others studied hadrosaur skin to see why did it preserve so well. Because skin has been found in ornithischians, sauropods, and theropods, but again, it's mostly been found in hadrosaurs. They looked at a partial hadrosaur with preserved skin, and they found pebbly and irregular scales. They also found two layers of the skin. The outer layer probably was the epidermis, and it had melanin, and the inner layer is probably the dermis. That's the tissue below the epidermis that has blood capillaries, nerve endings, and more. And on average, the skin was about three millimeters thick. That's important because, like you were saying, Garrett, before, it was thought that the thickness of the skin is why hadrosaur skin preserves so well. But it turns out that the thickness of the skin is not a factor. Because the hadrosaur specimen skin was thinner than cetacosaur skin that's been found. Cetacosaur skin was about 10 millimeters thick. And it's also thinner than rhinos, which are 15 to 25 millimeters thick, and elephants that are 10 to 15 millimeters. But we do have a cetacosaur. It's kind of interesting because it's like we can only compare to the other ones we have that are preserved. So it's hard to say like mm -hmm. which ones are better because you we mostly have hadrosaur skin, which is, of course, the thickness of hadrosaur skin. But what the other ones were, maybe they were much thinner mm. and we don't have them. So we don't know for comparison. True. Or they could be much thicker, like you're saying, some of these other animals. Mm -hmm. With this hadrosaur skin, the team also found blood vessel fragments and eumelanin which may mean that it was gray in color, similar to a rhino or elephant. But there's too many variables, so we still don't know for sure what color it was. They were thinking that the preservation of the skin could be more due to the structure of the skin and the composition. Mm -hmm. But they also found clay minerals and carbonates with the specimen. So maybe it's kind of like the Burgess Shale fossils that way, which is buried in the right sediments. Yeah, for sure. It is interesting because we don't think about it that much, but like, all our body is chemistry. It's all different chemicals, all connected and, you know, very, a huge variety of chemicals <laughs> near each other. So if their skin had a different chemical makeup because they were evolving for millions and millions of years, the mummies are very far distant from the other Ornithischians, let alone the other Saurischians. Like, say, for example, they just had a little bit more calcium or something in their skin. Maybe that helped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Or maybe, you know, just more connective tissue in there. Yeah. I'd say it's still very early days when it comes to studying soft tissue in dinosaurs. So there's a lot left to learn. Yeah. And it doesn't preserve at all like a complete chunk of skin. You know, so even if it was three millimeters thick, it's not like we get this even three millimeter layer mm -hmm. of skin all over the place like it just got buried and fossilized as is it really still decayed quite a bit it just didn't decay completely to nothing mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like it, get, it decayed 98 percent rather than 100 percent. so we still don't have that much to work with and you still have to do a lot of inferences in your chemical analysis of like okay i think this is probably collagen here and all that kind of stuff but you're really still working with traces of what was originally there yeah in the papers i've been reading it's a lot of like these collagen like areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things like that. Because you don't know 100%, although it, it's the thing that makes the most sense in that context. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you can figure out with soft tissues, and I mentioned it earlier when I listed a bunch of things, is blood vessels, which has been a pretty controversial topic. In 2003, Mary Schweitzer and others studied a T-Rex that had been found also known as the B-Rex, that's the one in the Museum of the Rockies. 
They used acid and they found that the femur bone had blood vessels. They compared it to ostriches and they found that they looked very similar. Again, there's been a lot of debate over this because for a long time, people thought that soft tissue couldn't stick around for tens of millions of years before, like it all should have degraded. Some people thought that this find wasn't soft tissue, but instead could have been contaminated by bacteria. So like bacteria invaded later and that's what they were seeing instead of soft tissue or instead oh, of blood vessels. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they, you can't really argue that it wasn't a soft tissue because they dissolved the bone and they were left with this wiggly piece mm-hmm. of something. So the only options are either it was a wiggly piece of something organic from tens of millions of years ago or from more recent, but it's definitely some kind of soft tissue. Mm-hmm. So in 2007, a study found that yes, this was soft tissue and specifically collagen because they found it to be similar to bird collagen and they found presence of soft tissue in other fossils. It was preserved because of iron's in the blood. It's part of a protein that carries oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and iron also reacts to other molecules. After an animal dies, the iron gets released and forms free radicals, which are uncharged molecules with an unpaired electron, and that makes them very unstable and highly reactive. According to an article on Life Science, Schweitzer said, quote, the free radicals cause proteins and cell membranes to tie in knots. They basically act like formaldehyde, end quote. And that means that they preserve tissue. There are crosslinks of amino acids that make proteins, and those make those proteins harder to decay. Also important is that Schweitzer and the team found a way to remove the iron from the samples so they could analyze those original proteins. In 2018, a study by Jasmina Wyman and others found soft tissues in fossils, including structures that looked like blood vessels. These structures weren't made of the original proteins, but instead had been changed into polymer compounds, a chemical compound with molecules bonded together, known as advanced glycoxidation end products, AGEs. Or ages. Ages, yeah. <laughs> Capital A, G, E, and then lowercase s. And advanced lipoxidation end products, also known as ALES. Or A L E S. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was changed by glycation, and that happens when chemically reactive proteins with glucose or lipid molecules cross link. In an article on Earth magazine, Wyman said that you can see this in food science. Quote, if you burn toast, the brown color that arises on the crust is due to the presence of these same compounds, end quote. And that could be why a lot of fossils are brown. Uh, That's a fun detail, because, yeah, almost all the skin and feathers and other soft tissue does turn out to be brown. Mm Mm-hmm. And these polymers are not good at decaying, which is a good thing for us. Turn it into plastic. (laughs) (laughs) It's an interesting way of looking at it. And we all know plastic can last tens of millions of years, so there you go. (laughs) We'll continue our episode on soft tissues in dinosaurs in a moment, but first, let's take a break for our sponsors. In 2019, Elizabeth Boatman and others, including Mary Schweitzer, studied the blood vessel structures found in the cortical bone, that's found on the outer part of a long bone, of a T-Rex specifically the nation's T-Rex, to show how soft tissue can be preserved in dinosaur fossils. And their paper included some really cool images, microscopic images of blood cells from the Mm T-Rex. They talked about how blood vessels in fossils is controversial because the methods of how blood vessel structures are preserved is not well defined. So they used two ways to demonstrate how blood vessel structures were preserved, one using iron and one via glycation. And they demineralized bone samples to look at the blood vessel tissue. Yeah, it's kind of how you always have to do it because in bones, the blood vessels are sort of this like web that grows in all sorts of crazy semi-random patterns throughout it. And when you have the bone around it, you just can't get at it. It's all just intermixed with it. So the only way to get at those blood vessels is to throw the bone in acid, dissolve the bone away, And then these soft tissue things don't get dissolved by the acid and you're just left with this weird, spongy, whatever soft tissue is left. Mm. So it's very destructive, these tests. 
I wonder how long that'll last if there'll be a new way to test these things in the future. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, even now with CT scans, you Mm -hmm. can see sort of the blood vessel network, but telling whether or not it is a different material. And then also they want to do sort of staining on it and things like that, like reacting it with different antibodies to see what reacts with it. It'd be really hard to do inside the bone, Mm -hmm. but there might be a way or you could just take a slice of it, I suppose. Yeah. Just like with histology. Mm -hmm. This team, they used a lot of techniques to show that there was collagen found in connective tissues and skin and elastin, which is also in skin. And these are two proteins specific to vertebrates. And the collagen was consistent with collagen in modern vertebrate animals. Yeah, it's helpful because it, I think what they're doing there is making sure that it's not bacteria or something. Yeah. (laughs) Some other weird contamination. This is soft tissue. Yeah, from a vertebrate. Mm -hmm. So it's a good possible foundation for future studies on preserving soft tissues and fossils. Yes. I mentioned earlier in the episode that we weren't going to talk about any new papers, but I was wrong. I forgot that there is one new paper (laughs) in here (laughs) published earlier this year, 2023. Landon Anderson wrote a paper about a chemical framework for preserving soft tissues and talked about how the iron and glycation methods are just steps in a single process for preservation. Hmm. So the first step is that the decomposing stops, and that could be the animal gets very quickly, or there's it's frozen, or it's desiccated and dried out, in other words, mummified. Next, there's the taphonomy of soft tissues that are not completely decomposed. And that includes the cross-linking from the iron and glycation methods. So those are important steps. And then it can be carbonized and there's more cross-linking. And all of this, quote-unquote, rigidifies the tissue and helps it keep its structure. Yeah, that is important because even if the molecules themselves stick around, if they dissolve in water and get carried away Mm -hmm. or just get mixed in with a rock... It doesn't help. They have to be still stuck together. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into preserving soft tissues, just like there's a lot when it comes to preserving a bone even. Yeah. I like that. I like thinking about it as sort of a a multiple step arc in what makes a soft tissue sample make it all the way to the present day. Mm -hmm. Because usually, like we say, and like most paleontologists say is like, well, it has to get buried really quickly. Mm-hmm. And then the assumption with soft tissue originally was like, well, it must have just gotten buried super extra really quickly <laughs> so that it didn't decay. Yeah. But really, we're you finding need more that's than not that. the case. Yeah. You need something that, like you said, rigidifies <laughs> or s- solidifies, I might say, that tissue, but also something that changes the chemical composition of it to make it more permanent Mm -hmm. because bone by itself lasts quite a while and it has that time to permineralize but soft tissue has to go through a different process and it has to happen a little quicker because otherwise it'll fall apart so i guess there is still a it has to happen quicker factor some time factor Mm -hmm. but not as quickly as we previously thought yeah i just want to mention quickly when it comes to jurassic park and the dna no finding soft tissues like blood vessels doesn't bring us any closer to finding DNA and being able to clone dinosaurs. Yeah, unfortunately, DNA is a really reactive and unstable molecule relative to most of these other things. So it, even in the absence of oxygen around it, it just it just breaks down all on its own. It doesn't really need to react with anything. It just sort of falls apart. I think pieces of DNA have been found. Yeah, you can get little pieces of it in really good examples especially like inside a bone or something like that, you can find these little bits of DNA, but it's it's never been enough or even close to enough to get even a full protein coded sequence out of it, let alone an entire genome. Although I do like to, you know, sort of fantasize that maybe if we could find enough of these fragments and have some sort of really powerful computer, maybe it could put them all back together. But <laughs> the opposite of the Jurassic Park message. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. That's how all us dino nerds feel. Mm -hmm. I want the small ones. I want the ones that can be pet. I don't want to have to worry about finding a T-Rex. Yeah. And for (laughs) several huge technologies, undiscovered technologies away from that happening at this point too, if ever. Mm. Another example with soft tissues has to do with feathers and colors. 
And we'll talk a lot more about feathers in the next episode of this mini-series, Beyond Bones. But real quick, we can tell some of the colors of some dinosaurs, and that's because of melanosomes, which are specialized structures within a cell that determine both the color of dinosaur feathers and of our hair. You can study fossilized melanosomes, and based on their shape, you can sometimes tell the color of the fossil. And you do this by comparing melanosomes in living animals to fossils. Yeah, melanosomes come up all over the place. So they can be in skin, they can be in feathers, they can be in hair, all sorts of different parts of animal bodies <laughs> that change color. Yes, and we have a great interview from a little while back, episode 399 with Maria McNamara, who talks about melanin and melanosomes in dinosaur colors. And for even more on dinosaur colors, you can check out a few of our other episodes. We talk about Sinoceropteryx as our dinosaur of the day in episode 299. And we know that Sinoceropteryx had a reddish light banded tail. And it was the first dinosaur to have its colors scientifically described. There's also Anchiornis, our dinosaur of the day in episode 388. And we know that Anchiornis was black and white and red. So that reminds me of a joke. What's black and white and red all over? Thank you, Ornest. Thank you, Ornest. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, I think the the punchline was newspaper back when people read newspapers because uh, it's black and white and you read the whole thing. Uh, and people read them all over the place. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you gotta explain that one because nobody reads newspapers all over the place anymore. Right, right. I guess that shows my age a little bit, but I've dinosaurized, dinosaurified a joke I used to tell. Yeah. <laughs> I think now it'd be like, what's black and white and red all over? It would be like a, a black and white smartphone. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't really work. Nah, it's <laughs> not the same. <laughs> and, and there's also our episode 400. We chatted with Michael Benton, and he talks a bit about dinosaur colors because he had a lot to do with those early scientifically described ones. Yeah, all this research has been done in the last 30 years. It basically, I think... Sinoceropteryx was described, I want to say in 1996, maybe 1993. It was in the 1990s, one way or another. So really, this is all pretty new research, especially in terms of science. Yes. Did you say 96? Yeah, that was my first guess. You're right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so a little bit after Jurassic Park, but still a while ago. But there's still a ton of work to be done in this area, and there aren't that many people specializing on it yet. No, but I hope more people do because it's really exciting. And I think part of the problem is there just aren't that many fossils <laughs> that mm. have such amazing preservation. But it could be maybe there'll be a new method that comes out and you can go back to fossils that have been studied and people were studying different aspects of it and go back and, like, oh, there is soft tissue here. Yeah, that's true. Certainly with demineralizing, you can try that on just about any dinosaur bone, mm -hmm. chuck it in some acid and see what happens. But people tend to be pretty hesitant to do that kind of destructive testing. Yes. That's why maybe in the future there'll be other ways to do this. Less destructive stuff. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So that's our first segment of Beyond Bones about soft tissue. And again, next week we will get more into feathers. So stay tuned. And before we move on to our dinosaur of the day, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. And now into our dinosaur of the day. Chilesaurus or Chilisaurus. We had three different ways of saying it. I'll probably say Chilesaurus revisited, which was a request from Morgan via our Patreon and Discord. So thank you. I think most English speakers would probably say Chilesaurus. Mm. I think you got Chilesaurus in my <laughs> in my head, so now that seems right. Well, maybe I'll just switch between the two. Mm -hmm. We've talked about Chilesaurus a few times including 2015 when it was first named. But again, like I said before, new stuff has come out, so it warrants revisiting. It was a dinosaur that lived in the late Jurassic around 150 million years ago in what is now Chile, or Chile, found in the Toki Formation. It looked like other early dinosaurs. It walked on two legs. It had a long tail, a longish neck, and a long body. If you think of like Massospondylus or Eodromaeus, <laughs> yeah, those very well-known dinosaurs. <laughs> I feel like Massospondylus is fairly well-known. Basically like a typical little bipedal dinosaur, but with a slightly longer neck. Mm. And it's estimated to be about 10 and a half feet or 3.2 meters long. 
It's been called a platypus dinosaur because it had a combination of features seen in theropods, ornithischians, and sauropodomorphs. For example, it had a theropod-like body, but it wasn't that great of a runner based on features in the shin bone and having a broad foot with a weight-bearing first toe. It had stout limb bones like sauropodomorphs and strong arms with a large first claw similar to basal sauropodomorphs. It had grasping hands, three short, thick fingers with two claws, and it was herbivorous. It had spatula-shaped teeth or leaf-shaped teeth. It was also ornithischian-like, with its ornithischian-like or bird-like hips. It had a backward-facing pubic bone, which would give it room for a large gut, and that is good if you're a plant eater, because you got to process all those plants. Mm -hmm. You had a big stomach, a lot of digestive tract. It also had a slender neck and a proportionally small head with a rounded skull, and it probably had a beak. When you list all those factors together, it definitely sounds like a sauropod, other than the fact that it walked on two legs and it was pretty skinny. And the backward-facing pubic bone. Oh, yeah, that's true. Sauropods didn't have that. Yeah. So, platypus dinosaur. (laughs) (laughs) I like that nickname. (laughs) A, I think we've talked about platypus dinosaurs before, because mm-hmm. a lot of them have strange combinations of features. Yes. Or at least what we think of as strange to a Chilesaurus, it was perfectly normal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the type species is Chilesaurus Diego Suarez I. It was named in 2015 by Fernando Novas and others, and the fossils were found in 2004 by Diego Suarez, who... He At the time, he was seven years old. He was with his geologist parents, Manuel Suarez and Rita de la Cruz, and his sister Macarena, and they were out hiking when he found a vertebra in a rib. That's the dream, right? Yeah. <laughs> Seven-year-old children all around the world are jealous of this kid. <laughs> <laughs> Although not a kid anymore. No. Well into their 20s. <laughs> <laughs> and the genus name, Chilesaurus, means chili or chile lizard and it refers to chile the country yes and the species name is in honor of diego more fossils were reported in 2008 they were thought to be the quote first significant remains of carnivorous dinosaurs end quote in chile from the jurassic because previously they'd only known isolated teeth from the late cretaceous in that country yeah i mean that's a good reason to name it after the country is expected to be a huge find. Well, they thought it was a carnivorous dinosaur. Yeah, it turned out not to be, most <laughs> likely. <laughs> Seems to be herbivorous. The holotypes an articulate, pretty complete skeleton of a juvenile. It's missing its feet and most of the tail, though. And four other partial skeletons and additional bones of juveniles and adults have been found. The holotype's about 50% the length of the largest individual found, at about 5.2 feet or 1.6 meter long. It's the first complete dinosaur found that lived in the Jurassic in what is now Chile. So it's still got that going for it. Yeah, and that actually, sometimes we lament the place name Saurus, place name Ensis, or place name Saurus, person name Ensis as being sort of a boring dinosaur name. But you can't be wrong. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to come back later and say, no, you didn't find that in Chile. You found that in Argentina (laughs) because they know where they found it. But they don't know, you know, it did change that they thought it was a meat eater and now it's a plant eater. But that fortunately didn't name it like big first ever carnivorous eater in Chile (laughs) Saurus. That's true. I like that they named it after the seven-year-old who found it. Yeah, that's very nice. So Novas and others said that, quote, Chilesaurus is a unique dinosaur lineage known only from southern South America, suggesting an outstanding case of endemism among otherwise relatively cosmopolitan worldwide Jurassic dinosaur faunas, end quote. Yeah, sometimes they get isolated and then they just look like nothing else, really. Yes. Originally, Chilesaurus was thought to be a tetanurin theropod. And that's a clade that includes megalosauroids, allosauroids, tyrannosauroids, ornithomimosaurs, compsognathids, and manoraptorans. Quite a diverse group of, is that all carnivores? Mostly carnivores. Yeah, well, I mean, theropods 
in general, that's, uh, that's most of the theropods that we know are tetanurin, mm -hmm. the ones that have stiff tails. So yeah, that's like pretty much all the theropods. Yes. But then in 2017, Matthew Barron and Paul Barrett found Chilesaurus to be the, quote, earliest diverging member of Ornithischia, end quote. And Chilesaurus was an early Ornithischian after splitting from Ornithoscolida. But that's what they were saying at the time. Yes. That should give you a hint that we don't really think about <laughs> Ornithoscolida anymore. Yep. But Baron and Barrett proposed that Chilesaurus was a missing link between carnivores and early herbivores. And in Ornithoscolida, they grouped together Ornithischians and theropods. But like we said, we don't really talk about Ornithoscolida anymore. And it seems that the latest is more that Silosaurs evolved into Ornithischians. Because the big question is, where did Ornithischians come from? Because for the, all of the Triassic, we don't have any Ornithischians. Mm -hmm. So this proposal was, well, they came from theropods, basically. And the new proposal is they came from Silosaurs. Yep. So I'm not sure what we consider Chilesaurus, which is why I said it's a dinosaur that lived in the Jurassic. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's still an Ornithischian? Yeah. Well, I mean, if it's a sauropodomorph, that would make it a Sauriscian. Mm. But we didn't actually, you didn't say it was a Sauriscian. You said it had a lot of sauropod features yep. and sauropodomorph features. Right. But it also had theropod and ornithischian features. So, yeah. Is it a theropod that looks like a sauropod or is it a sauropod that looks like a theropod? <laughs> I'm going to leave it up to future papers. Yeah. It did have some interesting features that upended what paleontologists thought when it came to when certain features evolved. Like, Chilesaurus didn't have a predentary bone, that's the bone at the tip of the bottom jaw, which previously everybody thought was a fundamental feature of Ornithischians. It also didn't have teeth in the front of its snout, and it had support for a beak, and that may mean that Ornithischians were already adapted to an omnivore or herbivorous diet before they had the predentary bone. But it did have that backward-facing pubis. So it's possible that that pubis position is related to being an herbivore and related to dinosaurs evolving longer, more complex digestive tracts. Yeah, we've seen that happen with other dinosaurs that evolved herbivory. Like, for example, Therizinosaurus probably had that backwards-facing pubis, even though it was a Sauriscian, so it should have been forward-facing. But we think it shifted over to make more room for those big herbivorous guts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe the same thing happened here with Chilesaurus. Like we mentioned earlier, sauropodomorphs did not have that backward pubis. And according to Baron and Barrett, that quote, may have condemned them to quadrupediality as any expansion of the gut anterior to the hips would have resulted in an anterior shift to the center of mass, end quote. I mostly quoted them because... <laughs> I thought it was interesting how it's like condemned them <laughs> to being four-legged. <laughs> yeah. Like it's basically like, oh, their guts were growing farther and farther forward. And so they couldn't get their hands off the ground. They were stuck yeah. with their hands on the ground forever. <laughs> Although it does seem like other dinosaurs managed to stay bipedal mm -hmm. while and sort of their hips evolving to be backwards facing. But not every animal can evolve the same way. So maybe sauropods just couldn't for whatever reason. Yeah. And that's fine by me. I love sauropods being four-legged and giant. Even though they were condemned to <laughs> state. But back to Chilesaurus. In 2017, Nicholas Timento and others studied the forelimb posture of Chilesaurus. All of the skeletons that they studied were found preserved in a way that looks like the resting posture of Maylong and other dinosaurs that look to be resting, like Cyornithoides and Albinicus. The arms are flexed toward the body and the hands are facing backwards. But what's interesting is that with Chilesaurus, the hind limbs are extended out. So it seems like the Chilesaurus individuals were buried quickly and fossilized in a life position while they were eating or resting. They're thinking they probably weren't sleeping because of the hind limbs being extended out. In advanced theropods, it's been suggested that the resting posture of the arms is related to soft tissue structures like the propatagium. That's the largest skin fold of the wing. So there we go. We've managed to get some soft tissue in the dinosaur <laughs> of the day to go with our Beyond Bones soft tissue episode. Yeah, I talked a bunch about the propatagium in an earlier episode when we were talking about wings. Mm -hmm. And basically, 
yeah, it prevents the arm from straightening all the way. So it could be that the arm is bent because there was some soft tissue holding it there, essentially. Yeah. So with Chalasaurus, having that flexed arm may indirectly indicate that it had a propatagium, which is an important feature for flying. I'm not saying Chalasaurus could fly, but it may have had features early on linked later to flying, just adding to its platypusness. Yeah. <laughs> or it, it had that structure there because it was a good place to display some feathers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there could be a lot of reasons. So that's Chalasaurus and other animals that lived around the same time and place as Chalasaurus include sauropods, like diplodocids, and titanosaurs, and crocodiliforms. For our fun fact, because I am doing this entire episode, <laughs> there are three paleo artists that influenced decades of how dinosaurs were depicted in comics and other media. This was in a paper in Geoscience Communication by Oliver Wings and others. And it's a really great paper. It's an overview of influential paleo comics and graphic novels from the last 120 years. And they also discussed developing the graphic novel Europosaurus Life on Jurassic Islands. We interviewed those authors, including Oliver, in episode 403. Yeah, it's a really cool book. They made Europosaurus really come to life and really cool story about day-to-day -day Europosaurus in the Mesozoic. Yes, and for that graphic novel, they had a lot of influences and inspiration from other artists, too. And then they talked about in this paper how they had to find their own style. So very interesting. I bring this up because I would argue that this is somewhat related to soft tissue. Because paleo art, you have to reconstruct or depict soft tissue. You don't want to just see a dinosaur painting without skin on the dinosaur. Unless maybe you're doing just a skeletal reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So yes, staying on theme. <laughs> and then if you make really influential guesses about where soft tissue might have been, it might end up just everybody sort of assumes that's how the soft tissue looked without ever really looking at the skeleton for themselves and thinking, mm -hmm. like, oh, it would be there. It's just sort of ingrained in the back of your head because you've seen these types of images so much. Exactly. And paleo art is often that template for how prehistoric life is depicted in various ways, including comics. The paper, they said, quote, although often exaggerated in their presentation, the original artwork can often still be recognized in the animal contours, body postures, and sometimes even color patterns. And also, quote, many panel drawings were almost exact copies of their academic originals, which were recycled again and again, end quote. Yeah, we've even seen toys where it's like, oh, that's a Zalinger stegosaurus because <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's just so recognizable, like the, the shapes and proportions that they used in some of the art. Yeah. They said that the paleo art of the classic era, which is from 1890 to the late 1960s, inspired so many generations of how dinosaurs were portrayed and are so well known in books, comics, and movies that a lot of people are familiar with the paleo artist's work from that time, even if they don't know the names of the artists. Yeah, because you see it just in like tons of movies and say like the, the T-Rex slash Allosaurus looks like in King Kong, and that's what the era looks like to you without realizing... Oh, that's a Charles Knight creation. Mm hmm But then later comic strips also, quote, independently align themselves with the prevailing scientific view and reconstruction, which, quote, makes comics chroniclers of advances in paleontology. And yeah. And then it's always funny when you see something from the 70s or 80s or even 90s, which is using that previous classic era style. And it's like, okay, they need to get with the times. <laughs> They're using the old paleo art, the old style, when they should be using the newer stuff. So I said there's three main paleo artists. I'll start with Charles Knight. You already named him. <laughs> <laughs> you actually named two out of three already. <laughs> but I'm curious to see what the third one is. <laughs> Charles Knight's a classically trained artist known for animal paintings. He worked with Henry Fairfield Osborne, and he reconstructed a lot of animals that Charles Marsh and Edward Cope described. And he's the first, quote, internationally renowned paleo artist. But I, we looked into this. The term paleo art didn't come up until like the 1960s to 1980s time frame. Mm. So he's probably just known as an artist in his time. Yep. Or a scientist. Yeah. His reconstructions are outdated today, but some of it holds up. Like he showed Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops as the, quote, eternal enemies. And another example is he made Leaping Laylax dynamic. I mean, we don't 
call it lay laps anymore, but the <laughs> fact that these animals were shown as dynamic yeah. is something. Yeah, their postures are still really cool and sort of modern. There are a lot of details of their anatomy, which is a little outdated. So you can't really say that piece of work was way ahead of its time in every way. But yeah, the fact that they're so active was definitely, it looks like something you would have seen 20 years ago, not 120 years ago. Yeah. And in this paper, they said that the early Tarzan and Turek series are, quote, unmissable testimonials to his work. Hmm. So if you're if you're familiar with those series, you got a lot of Charles Knight influence there. You got Charles Knight to thank. Yeah. Then next up is Rudolf Zallinger, who you also already mentioned. <laughs> That's how influential they are. They come up <laughs> without even... Yeah. <laughs> now, he's known for his giant mural, The Age of Reptiles, at the Yale Peabody Museum, which is about 110 feet or nearly 34 meters long. Very large. The size of a large dinosaur, one might say. <laughs> yeah, 110 feet. That's a, a pretty typical, this is one of the longest sauropods ever. It's uh, up to 110 feet long. <laughs> <laughs> or the length of The Age of Reptiles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It took him years to make this mural. It started with an offer to add, quote, some kind of decoration to the large wall in the museum. Yeah, I think we watched some documentary on it and they were basically saying they wanted him to make a few little paintings to sort of mix in like you'll have a there's a big mount of a sauropod and like, let's stick a little painting of a sauropod next to it. And then he was like, how about I cover that entire huge wall with one massive mural? Yeah. And not only just a mural. How about I do it as a fresco in like the most complicated and just like it's impressive artistic, just amazing thing you could possibly imagine. We have to go see that wall one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We talked to them about it because they were redoing or they are still redoing the Yale gallery there and all the mounts. And while they're doing all that construction work, they had to cover it and keep it climate controlled and dust proof and everything because they really don't want it to get damaged in any way because it's mm -hmm. such an important mural yeah but it apparently wasn't made famous until life magazine reprinted the model of it and then got really famous yeah that was that little uh factoid about it that the life picture of it isn't the actual mural mm -hmm. it's his smaller version that he drew to prepare for making the big thing because mm -hmm. they they couldn't photograph or document the massive mural well at the time yeah now, his Tyrannosaurus from that mural is often in comics and stories like Turok, which, quote, were graphically based on this single image of a dinosaur in side view. Kind of looks like Reptar to me <laughs> from oh, Rugrats. You could say Reptar was inspired by Zalinger then. Yeah. All right. The last, the third, last but not least artist is the Czech artist Zdeněk Burian who was very influential in the mid and late 1900s. He was prolific something like 1300 images and sketches <laughs> when you can break a thousand that's impressive mm -hmm. and he started by illustrating adventure and science fiction novels then he worked with paleontologist joseph augusta and then other scientists and he made some books on evolution and the history of man in the paper, the author said, quote, despite the Iron Curtain, his works have been translated and exported worldwide since the 1950s and his depictions of prehistoric animals can, quote, be traced precisely to Turok number 11 in 1958, end quote. And his depictions actually started to replace Knight and Zallinger's depictions in comics. I had no idea. You probably knew to some extent, because if we saw something that resembled, you know, that referenced his art, we probably would recognize it, but we didn't necessarily know his name. Yeah, that's true. The authors also said, quote, although existing for about 200 years, paleo art still struggles for its reputation to be regarded as real art compared to the classic genres, end quote. That's what's so special about Zalinger's mural, because it's it's sort of in the classical style, but it's also paleo art. Yeah. So I think it helped to bridge that gap a little bit. Yes. In paleo art, I mean... If you're listening to this podcast, you probably agree. It's important because it links science and public awareness about it. It brings those theories to life. Yeah, we often point out that papers that really grab the attention of the public are usually those that have paleo art associated with them. Mm -hmm. If you publish a paper, it could be the most exciting dinosaur ever. But if you don't have any art to go with it and you're just describing what bones, like shapes of bones and 
zygapophyses and things like that <laughs> like the average person isn't interested but if you have a really cool picture to go with it it takes it to a whole other level yeah so on that note comics and graphic novels are great because they're accessible and they're a good way to introduce science and dinosaurs and get people excited about it just a quick definition comics are the panels of images with text and other visual information and then graphic novels are made of comic content and they tell longer and sometimes more complex stories huh. i never thought of that before yeah i didn't either except when i'm reading a graphic novel i I think of that differently than if I were to see a comic in a newspaper, for example. So there's newspaper comics because the comic is just like, just like you can have a newspaper column. A column can be anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> including a newspaper. And then a, a graphic novel is kind of like a book comic. Yeah. Tells a story. Far Side. There, that, that's a comic. But then there's graphic novels like the one on Europasaurus. Now, in the beginning, most books and articles and other forms of communicating about dinosaurs were meant for adults, which surprised me to read. <laughs> but maybe it shouldn't have. By the 1950s, illustrated books, though, were made more for kids. Hmm. And now there's so many children's books about dinosaurs that the general public thinks dinosaurs are quote-unquote kid stuff. Though there are lots of popular science books for adults. Now, unfortunately, paleontology is moving so fast these days, but it takes a long time to publish, so the books can get outdated pretty quickly. Yeah, because they weren't outdated when they were written, but by the time they're <laughs> in your hands, they might have been written a year or two earlier. Yeah. So the authors for this paper argued that up-to-date scientific information can be quickly and effectively communicated via comics. <laughs> or podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Uh. <laughs> Maybe there'll be another paper someday about podcasts and other ways to talk about dinosaurs <laughs> anyway the prehistoric and dinosaur comics are usually intended for younger audiences most of them are sci-fi fantasy horror mystery western or superheroes but some are scientific and embed more scientific information in them i feel like a lot of the comics you talk about are a superhero that has like a, a dinosaur sidekick yeah we've seen those comics and then seen the tv shows that are adapted from those comics and it's it's just like what you said Prehistoric animals in comics started as just entertainment, and the animals are these forces of nature. They're usually dangerous, they're carnivorous, they can be threatening, but they often don't survive when they encounter humans. They're often found in lost world areas or other planets or through time travel. The earliest comic with dinosaurs is from 1893. It's called Prehistoric Peeps, which I didn't realize and it was so early on. Yeah, prehistoric peeps sounds like something that would come out in like 2010, not <laughs> 1893. <laughs> There's a lot of great examples in their paper. I'm just going to talk about a few of them. There's a multi-part Sunday edition of Tarzan in 1932 that had a carnivorous sauropod and, quote, impressively colorful Tyrannosaurus rex. <laughs> <laughs> that carnivorous sauropod trope was really funny. It yeah. kind of died before the 50s, but it was around for a while. And it appeared a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and later, there were some comics with peaceful encounters with dinosaurs, like uh, Donald Duck and his nephews apparently had in 1957. Oh, yeah. I watched that one. It's kind of like dinosaurs encountering dinosaurs, if you think about it. Yeah. I think that one was a friendly sauropod dinosaur. Mm. Maybe even friendlier than the duck dinosaurs. Oh. <laughs> There's some adventure stories with more educational information to go with them. So one example was the serial Turok, Son of Stone. There's 131 issues from 1954 to 1982. And Turok and Andar are in a lost valley with a lot of prehistoric animals. Each issue had supplementary pages that explained more about the animals and talked about behavior or evolutionary patterns. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I was trying to think because I thought of that as kind of like a caveman style. Mm -hmm. How do you make that educational? You uh, add supplementary. <laughs> yeah. <thanks. laughs> There's some more recent examples, too, like Paleo by Jim Lawson. That's an anthology of dinosaur stories from the late Cretaceous. There's Age of Reptiles by Dark Horse Comics, and the later stories especially were told like animal documentaries. You can also see this in Tag Galusha's Cretaceous. We talked to him about Cretaceous in episode 239. There's a Tyrannosaurus family struggling with Apertosaurus and Dromaeosaurus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a fun one. It was. There's also comic science books where they use comics to summarize concepts and explain them through speech bubbles or one-liners. So one example in the paper is 
Earth Before Us, a trilogy that follows a scientist and young girl through geological eras, and they mostly use speech bubbles, but they also have a glossary. And sometimes books are a mix of comics and textbook styles. So one example is Mimo on the Dinosaur Trail, which was published in 2016, and it's about a dinosaur excavation in France. You've got an ornithomimosaur, Mimo, and his carcharodontosaur friend, <laughs> Hector, and they're in danger and they got to work together. Ornithomimosaur and carcharodontosaur working together at last. Unlikely friendships. <laughs> really. <laughs> in the comics, you learn about their ecosystem, and after the story, there's sketches and explanations of the actual dig. Oh, cool. It is cool. So, yeah, graphic novels can be a good teaching tool, and they're accessible, they're interesting, though the authors said that they're best used with other teaching tools like dioramas or original objects because, quote, illustrations can still leave room for misinterpretation, end quote. So yeah, that was a lot about paleo art. <laughs> paleo art is all about showing soft tissue. It is. Very rarely do you see the actual bones. Mm -hmm. They're almost always covered in something squishy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino, the first in our mini-series Beyond Bones. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be continuing with this series where we'll talk about feathers. I'm taking over. Yep. <laughs> 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 if you like listening to I Know Dino, then please share our show with a friend. It really helps. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.